collecting and using accurate data to make decisions and solve problems is key. It may be that you're measuring the wrong data, but you will understand that because the data will show improvement and you can see that it's not the case in real life. Hi, I'm Adam Howe, a partner in Hydrogen Struggles New York office. I lead our digital transformation service offering and I'm a member of the culture shaping practice. I spend my life advising clients on how to best align their talent, culture, and organization design to deliver on their purpose and strategy. Today, I'm super excited to be joined by Sophia Velastegui. Sophia is the Chief Product Officer at Aptiv based in Boston. She joined Aptiv, a worldwide technology company with a mission to be green, safe, and connected and to drive the future of mobility. Sophia has streamlined the product platform and portfolio, especially around AI software and cloud. Sophia also serves as a board director and an audit committee member for Blackline, a financial accounting software services company based out of California. In the time before Aptiv, Sophia spent five years at Microsoft as the chief technology officer of AI for business applications and was the general manager of AI products and services, including search. During her time at Microsoft, Sophia's team were responsible for investigating open AI and ChatGBT applied across Microsoft assets, such as Microsoft Dynamics, Bing Search, and the Power Platform. Sophia also worked three years at Google Alphabet as the global head of Silicon Architecture and Apple, where she was the platform architect, think tank manager, as well as running special projects. I also have to mention that Sophia has been recognized multiple times at Business Insider as the world's most powerful female engineer and also works with the World Economic Forum. And with that, Sophia, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here to have this conversation. It's a passion area for me as well. Awesome. Sophia, in your career, what would you say the leadership capabilities are most important to your success and why? Whether it's leadership or in technology, a growth mindset is key. This framework encourages curiosity and experimentation as the world is changing faster than ever before. The curiosity really fuels that continuous learning and problem solving to really help me look around the corner. And experimentation helped me to constantly look for improvements and new ways of solving problems. For every A-B testing, one will fail and it's okay because you'll be learning throughout the journey. This growth mindset was key for me to go from a mechanical engineer and semiconductor at Applied Materials to AI detail in Microsoft to investigate AI and ChatGPT, and now Chief Product Officer at Active in Automotive and Autonomous Driving. Awesome. And as I mentioned in your intro, you work for some of the world's most acclaimed technology organizations. And in the spirit of curiosity, I'll be really curious as to what you've seen them get right from an organization, culture, talent, and leadership perspective. I've been very fortunate to work at some big tech companies, but before they became big tech. As example, at Apple, I was there in 2009 when iPhone was new and it was only 34,000 employees and now 180,000 people. Nest was a startup that got purchased by Google. Uh, It was 250 people. And then with Google as a whole, doubled in size to over 100,000. And when I joined Microsoft in 2017, it was literally considered a dinosaur in Silicon Valley. And Windows was a separate business unit. And after I joined, AI really exploded and we saw that open AI and infusion of AI across all the business unit became top priority. And that really increased the market cap from $670 billion to $2.6 trillion. And one of the things that I've noticed in my journey is that there's a real focus on people and the organization that's set up for experimentation and agility. They actually achieved this in numerous fronts. So a McKinsey report stated that a high-performing software engineer outperforms an average engineer by 8x. So how can you pan this out, not just in software engineering, but all engineers when you see this improvement? So how does our culture amplify an environment that really infuses and fosters that culture of high performers? One of the things they did was review seeing who leaves and where they go and who joins and where do they come from. Is this the right blend of the infusion of talent and mindset to make our culture that much better? I love that analysis of who's leaving and, and who's joining and what that tells you about the organization. It'll be interesting to get your views that most digital transformations fail to meet their stated objectives. 
So kind of flipping that to think about the reasons for failure, I'd be really curious to understand your thoughts on what those reasons might be from a kind of people, culture, and leadership perspective. One of the things I saw common across the organization, and when I was an AI CTO, I actually worked with a lot of non-digital native companies across the world, is that when a digital native company thinks about digital transformation, it's not a one-time event. This continuous learning and enhancement of the environment on all aspects of the company. It's not just about infusing technology for IT or infrastructure. It's not just infusing technology or AI in the product or engineering. It's how we do work. It's how we operate end-to-end, whether it's with HR or finance or how we recruit. It's how do we use that data and that knowledge in order to enhance everything we do. Yeah, I love that. And maybe if we go a little bit deeper there, if we think about the traditional or non-digital native organizations, if they're to be more successful with their digital transformation efforts, perhaps we can get a little bit specific on your views on how they, for example, organize for digital. How do you kind of blend specialist expertise and a center of excellence with building digital in the business? You know, what are the two to three mindsets you think that are required in the culture and perhaps really interesting, I think, for many listeners of this podcast is for kind of super senior leaders, how do we start to help them build digital savviness? Yeah. One of the things is that the digital transformation we're talking about, it does have to be tied into a business outcome and a business benefit so that there is not a conflict of interest. This is a way to infuse and enhance, maybe even accelerate what we're trying to do. One of the things that's really learning from digital natives What do I mean by that is I find that the culture of the mindset that I talked about and how to infuse it and being just very comfortable with leveraging digital assets is that you need about 10, 15% of the population to really cross that chasm and really increase the adoption rate. Because that's enough of a workforce that can really advocate and evangelize it across the company. And the area that I focus on is first line managers. How do you get 10, 15% of them to be more digital native? And you need about 10, 15% of the executive level, the sponsors and the cross sponsors to be really bought into that. What do I mean by learning from digital native? Digital native is you assume that technology will change and the people and company will change with them. And it's not something that's just us. It's not that you have mobile and you stop. You're constantly changing with it. There's new app, there's new capabilities. You're always looking on. These are the people who are the early adopters of cell phones, leveraging AI into the work environment. But one thing that's really important when you do digital transformation is making sure to measure it and monitor to determine the effectiveness. And knowing what your baseline is beforehand is really important. And digital native in some ways, it's like an overall purpose, almost like a religion in a way and how they think about it, that everything they do, if they can use technology to improve HR, even they have nothing to do with HR, that's great. And these are reinforcing practices. And since it's a practice and behavior, that's why having 10 and 15 percent of the population I stated is very important because a practice and behavior It's the basis of a culture. And you need a seed that's strong enough, a community that's strong enough to go reinforce that practice. Another thing that I saw across all of the organization is how do they get the message out? It's really leaning on storytelling. Mm. How do you leverage storytelling of why we need to change our mindset to become more digital native in our perspective that is tied into and actually benefits our business in the market as a whole. Storytelling is what makes it memorable. Storytelling of, I have an example of a intern one time at Apple. They had a problem with the iMac. This is one of the first few iMacs where the display and the tower, the compute was integrated to each other. And as you know, with Apple, they always want to make it thinner and thinner. Mm-hmm. And most of these desktop iMac were rectangular in space. But what she did is she determined the optimal curvature to give the optical illusion of thinness. 
So in the very edge, it's very, very thin. But at the middle, which is further away, you don't see it. It's actually much, much thicker than other rectangular eye mats. She was an intern and was asked to head the product design. This is where practical innovation that delight is rewarded. And it's not about your time in the role. It's the fact that that innovation fundamentally changed the perspective of the product. I love that story. What would be your advice to organizations that could look at that example of really empowering an intern to bring his or her kind of best views and ideas into a use case like that? That's easy to say, harder to do. So what's your advice for execs to be able to create that culture where people can lean in regardless of their experience, regardless of their level in the organization? What would you say? One of the things that I find really key to the culture that really amplifies this digital native environment of curiosity and experimentation is what is the culture that you need in your environment that encourages rapid experimentation? That is A-B testing. And by the way, one of them will fail. And that is a good thing. And you will learn from that and quickly determine that insight to also reincorporate in the next experimentation, which will be more refined. There's a saying that I had in Microsoft, celebrate the red, Mm -hmm. which means like I would rather find out what are the issues in my development environment before it gets deployed to a billion users. That's when you get real problems. Another thing that I really love is that you need to dog food your own work. I give the example in that we were making the first thermostat and we're optimizing the algorithm. And I was living with my grandmother and I had kids of my own. And I said, grandmother, this is the future of thermostat. It has AI. It's going to learn everything about you. It's so cool. It's like, that's so beautiful because it was very beautifully designed with the glass feature and everything. I'm so glad you work. You left Apple to go to Nest. And then three days later, it's like, why does this Nest thermostat want a relationship? I don't need it nagging me. I have your grandfather for that. Why is it constantly asking me to give you more input or more like adjustment of the thermostat? I told you this yesterday. I said, grandma is AI, but it needs to learn your habit. And your habit is changing throughout the week. It's like, Sophia, you need to get rid of it. I don't need this nagging relationship. I can only do one as your grandfather. I'm sorry. (laughs) And since we're dog fooding it, I could have obviously dismissed her statement and said, what does she know? She doesn't know anything about technology. She grew up in the 1920s in South Korea. Versus, wow, the return policy on this device is 7, 14 days. My grandma would definitely have returned this. Or she would have told me to go return it. And I'm just like, grandmother, thank you. Let's not have this kind of relationship. I'm going to go return it. So we still had to go solve it. But we also knew that what you do on the weekday is very different than what you do on the weekend. So how do I preset the information? Understanding that learning will be in two phases. The first two days on the weekday and the one day on the weekend and preset it. And then the second thing we did because of the feedback is how does other people behave on the weekday and weekend that's similar in their behavior the first two days that this household is similar to. Obviously, my grandmother took all credit for the success of NAS and that I got it purchased by Google. It was not her. But it's okay. The fact of the matter is you're dog fooding and really understanding in real life what is happening. And how do you make that as a great thing versus, hey, you're in trouble your customer want to go return this product. It's not a failure. You're learning from this and you're learning in a way that's constantly making the product better. Number two is self-organization. How do you have this collaboration that's fluid across function, geographic, hierarchy, and organization boundary to get things done? Really empowering that, encouraging that. Number three is driving decision with data. Collecting and using accurate data to make decision and solve problem is key. It may be that you're measuring the wrong data, but you will understand that because the data will show improvement and you can see that it's not the case in real life. But it's having that understanding to quantify things. It's that discipline that's needed. And on that note is on AI and ML. AI and ML is about data. As you get used to leveraging decision with data and high quality data, you can then leverage that same data for 
machine learning and AI benefits and productivity. And last of all is being obsessive over the customer. Not saying that you adhere to everything they want. Like my grandmother just says, take the product out. I'm not going to go listen to that customer. It's about, hey, what she said has valid terms. How can we improve the product? So it's not that frustration point. Our job is to go delight them. And just really understanding who are your customer. Apple and with Ness and Google, it was age 7 to 70. Been a long time since I was 70 years old, and I haven't been 70 yet. But how can you really obsess about your customer and put yourself in their shoes? Yeah, I love the specificity of some of those insights. We all know that grandmothers are usually right. So that was a good example of dog fooding, as you say. So I'm curious, as you think about some of the non-digital native organizations, so those that haven't grown up being a digital organization, they're doing something more traditional or have been around for a long time, but aspire to building some of the things that you've talked about there. Who are some of the organizations that you would look to as exemplars of some of the things you've just talked about? One thing that I think is really important for top leaders in the organization is that mindset of continuous learning and curiosity. And I really focus on learning things quantitative and qualitative. What I mean by that is reading books, attending seminars, listening to podcasts, and meeting experts in their field. Most of the experts, they're passionate about sharing their insight. And how can you leverage that to go learn from other people or other industry? I want to give an example of Apple. They have a great example of really learning from other industry. We found out that most people, their passcode for the iPhone is 0000 or 1234. So we're like, that's not going to provide the security they're expecting. So we asked them to change the passcode. But what ended up happening is their passcode got changed to 1111 or 234. Again, not really meeting and we knew we can do better. So we also knew that everyone has the secret wish to be James Bond, or in my case, Jane Bond. And so that's how the fingerprint biometric came to be and launched on iPhone 5S in 2013. So as a leader, how can you do this? Because it's not going to change. The genie is out of the bottle and all C-suite will be transformed. So here's an example, a CIO used to be about IT infrastructure and bringing various devices online. It's now going to cybersecurity and AI and business application, leveraging data structure and ontology. Chief marketing officer, which was print and then moved to TV and then social and influencer. How can you then leverage search engine optimization and chat GPT to provide the compelling notice or story around what we are doing. CFO, mind you, many years ago was Excel and then various SAP. But then how can you leverage SAP and other ERP system with other system of records and automate the flow of information to ensure that your forecasting predictive analytics is even better than before and introduce automation? CHRO went from performance management of people management alone versus looking at people analytics. I gave the example before of a previous company at Microsoft where we really looked at the culture and the people that are coming into Microsoft, where they came from, who they are, and the people who are leaving Microsoft and how does that impact our culture? These are just some of the examples of technologies impacting the executive suite. I'd be really curious, Sophia, to understand which traditional or non-digitally native organizations you would look at to be an exemplar of some of the things that you've talked about in this conversation? Some of the success stories you've heard are the companies I work with, Apple and Microsoft and Google. Active is the company I'm working at currently and how they're incorporating uh, modern software consideration with middleware DevOps and software development tool chain are example of organization that is really exemplary. Another example that I love is John Deere. How are they leveraging autonomous driving capabilities in their agricultural use cases to really optimize the pressure, the gathering, 
the care of the different agriculture that feeds the world. I found that to be very innovative in how they're doing it. They have a great culture that is very open to learning from other industry. That's one thing I would say I appreciate in a lot of these companies is the fact that they know that maybe it's never been done in their industry, but how can you learn from other industry associated with it? I want to give another example in semiconductor, AMD. In the beginning, they were working and competing against Intel. And what they decided is still, instead of being monolithic in their architecture, revealing areas that can be modular in design and focusing on nano releases based on how market condition or advancement happen. And that was long term. It took five years or so, but a really different mindset and capability and conviction from the top down. We've seen a lot of buzz around generative AI with the surging popularity in chat GPT this year. And I guess disruptive technologies will continue to emerge like this. And as they do, Sophia, I'd be really interested in your advice to C-suite leaders around things such as how do you start to build these technologies into improving how your company currently operates and or creating new business models and propositions? So one of the things that I wanted to highlight is what makes generative AI or chat GPT fundamentally different from these earlier waves of AI is that previously or traditional AI is really designed and trained by specialized, highly structured tasks, highly educated data scientists and those who have worked in those environments. The game changer for generative AI is that now it has these human-like ability in using reason, language, and generating content and making decisions that is accessible for anybody that speaks the language. And so that you no longer have to have this breadth of technical knowledge before getting the benefits of AI. And one of the things that will happen with generative AI is because of the accessibility, more and more people will adopt it and feel comfortable with it. There's a lot of AI behind search, mm-hmm. whether it be Bing search or Google search. And the fact that it's now accessible by many people and how it can be surfaced, whether it's for business application or personal application, is one of the biggest difference. And going back to the question you stated, like how do you start building these technology into improving your current company operations as well as creating the new business model? The first thing is to really focus on what are the business needs as well as value creation you're targeting. It should not be disconnected from that. It's not a separate technology or project that's disconnected from the business needs of the company. How soon do you start building these technologies into improving how your company currently operates or to create new business models and propositions? AI is not going away. So it's very important that one becomes comfortable with it. And one of the things that generative AI is fundamentally different from earlier ways of AI is that traditional AI was really designed and trained for specialized, highly structured tasks by highly technical individual data scientists, machine learning engineers. What generative AI has shown the world that it has the human-like abilities to use language, reason, generate content, and make decisions in a way that's accessible to everyone. And so it's important that you have a framework that allows you to leverage it now because it will not go away because of the accessibility. It is something that can be adopted across an organization. The one thing to note with ChatGPT specifically, it is an open platform. So any information that's inputted there will become public knowledge. If there's any concern of what would be shared out to Wall Street Journal or to your competitor, that's not something you would use chat GPT for. So the three things, whenever I have any advanced technology that we have seen in a high tech company that is really leveraging AI, number one is having a governance cross-functional group that provides what is the policy of how AI can be used. Number two is having an understanding about the data that is available in the company. And number three is finding very high value business needs that AI can be leveraged. And so those framework is essential so that you do not waste resources and have pilots to be successful. Great. And I guess building on that point, how do you think about 
allowing kind of broader access to these technologies. So I guess there's a balance to be got right between letting individuals experiment organically and building kind of more dedicated teams with perhaps more formal training. One of the things I would say is with generative AI, so the formally trained and building a dedicated team was because of the fact that AI was in a form, the traditional AI was formed that you have to be highly specialized. What is nice about generative AI is that it's not accessible to a numerous type of people. So when I stated a previous question about having various pilots going across the organization, prioritize based on business needs is that it's important that the experiment happens across multiple different functions and capabilities within the organization. That will help the leaders in the C-suite understand the benefit as well as the capability of AI in their environment. That's one of the most important things to understand the full value and potential. Awesome. Whose job is it, do you think, to spot these emerging trends? I mean, AI has been around and been talked about for a while, but ChatGPT over the last 12 months has kind of arrived on the scene. So who do you think kind of holds that responsibility inside organizations? And I guess a bit linked to that is how do you accelerate the C-suite's understanding and accelerate curiosity around these emerging technologies? So I have seen various different models of whose job it is to spot these emerging trends. A lot of the companies have chief technology officer, but in a company like Apple, there is no CTO. So how is that the case? is whoever is responsible for enabling technology in your organization across the company, not just for productivity or for IT reason. And that may show up in different ways. It could be a chief product officer who has a technical knowledge and curiosity, or it could be the CTO to enable some of the technology infrastructure. I've seen also cases of different parts of the CFO organization because of the fact that the implication of how AI can amplify their business and the gains in productivity and innovation. How do you accelerate the C-suite's understanding and curiosity in emerging technologies? I find it extremely helpful to have these monthly brand back lunches or fireside chats with experts in the field, whether it's from a startup to specialists. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone in your own industry of how they're leveraging AI as well as other emerging technology. And it's also important to ask these hypothetical questions to those experts. If you were to apply for supply chain, considering your technical background, what are some of the things that come top of mind? A lot of times people think about emerging technology and that it's limited to technology or IT. I have seen that in the high-tech company, technology is something that is infused in every single business unit and subject matter area across the whole company. How can AI be used, as example, in human resources? How can AI be used in finance to give various insight and higher prediction? I see that that's something that's been done at scale across Microsoft under Amy Hood. Awesome. And as we finish up today, I'd be curious as to, from a leadership perspective, if you had one piece of advice for a CEO or for a senior leader about to embark on the latest iteration of their digital transformation journey, what would be that piece of advice to prepare them for continuous technological evolution? Yeah. Stay curious. Have speakers or experts come to their board or to the CEOs to speak about the different technology. And not just the technology itself, but also what are the behaviors you would see if it was implemented well? And the reason I say that there is this concept of a shadow of the leader. Well, that also the shadow of a behavior or culture can be seen in their secondary behavior and tertiary behavior. So asking those experts, if this is done well, what are the things that's obvious from the top level? But what are other secondary behaviors I should start seeing? Because sometimes as executives, information does get filtered. So this is a great way to really see in a measurable way how things are truly happening in your company, whether you sit on a board or you're a CXO. Yeah, I love that. And that kind of what we need to be true is really pertinent. So 
That's great, Sophia. Well, thank you very much for making the time to speak with us today. We've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure always having a conversation with you.